So hello, my name is Jen Rigsby. I'm a Pathwork Helper. This is going to be a brief presentation on the self-study guide for April 2015. And the topic for April is dreams and daydreams. And it includes a variety of material. It includes uh, material from Patrick Lecture 98 on wishful daydreams. It includes a document by Ava Paracas, who channeled the Patrick Guide, on pointers for dream interpretation. And it also includes material from Ava's book, The Path to the Real Self. Most of this information is available for download at no cost. Um, I'm going to mount the website addresses at the end of the presentation, uh, but you can download the material. You can download the study guide that I prepare. I have monthly newsletters, um, and I also host a weekly self-study group discussion where I invite people to share their experience of working with the Pathwork lectures and concepts, applying it to their daily life. Um, I suggest tools and techniques. Uh, I offer to help in places where they might feel stuck. Um, and for this little presentation, I even invited some of the regular people who attend the weekly meetings to join me here. And either during or at the end of the presentation, if they have any questions, they're going to speak up. Uh, so we're using teleconference software, so they're, um, they're present, but they've got a, they're muted. Uh, so dreams and daydreams. Um, I divide the study guide up into weekly portions, and then I, I email out one portion at a time every week uh, so that people have just a portion of the study guide where they can look at it uh, during the week. So it doesn't feel overwhelming. The study guides are 14 pages long, but two to three pages a day, a week, uh, may not feel like an overwhelming amount of material to read. Uh, and so I divided this study guide into five sections. The first section is about Ava Paracas's teachings on dreams and dream interpretation. The second portion is the Pathwork Guides teachings on daydreams. The third section is on the spiritual purpose of sleep and spiritual paradoxes. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation. Then there's a section on translating spiritual messages. And finally, the teachings from Patrick Lecture 98 on wishful daydreams. Um, the areas of confusion, or at least the areas of confusion that that I've heard from students and, and clients. Um, for instance, what is the purpose of sleep? And according to the Pathwork Guide, the purpose of sleep is to reconnect to spirit, not during the entire night's sleep, but for a given period of time. It could be that this time is what we call REM sleep. And that may be why REM sleep in particular is so important for mental and physical health. So from a spiritual standpoint, the body is refreshed by sleep in general, but the spirit is refreshed during REM sleep because that's when the mind, the soul, slips away from the earth plane and goes into spirit. Now, Part of the reason I thought I would give this little talk is a lot of this can be confusing because you don't have to go anywhere to slip from the earth plane to the spirit plane. They can coexist in the same space, like two galaxies passing through each other. They don't exclude each other. But it's a matter of going to a different level of perception. So the idea in these lectures is that the purpose of sleep is to refresh your spirit, in effect to go home. And to, the guide talks about talking to people, having experiences, learning things, um, working on things with spirit guides. Uh, heaven only knows what you might be doing uh, in that time period. 
and then you come back. Now, when you come back, I'm going to invite you to consider that the world of spirit is more complicated than the earth plane. The guide gives specific examples, and I list them in the study guide as spiritual paradoxes. For instance, the guide says that there are more colors in the spirit world than we experience here as human beings, than our eyes can perceive. So the human spectrum is relatively small, scientifically, compared to the light spectrum. But the guide is saying that it's bigger than that. And the example he gives is that if the color spectrum was a 1,000 page book, humans only experience five pages. So imagine that if you are an artist and you go into spirit and you have a creative experience based upon millions of colors that do not exist in the earth plane. And you come back into your human mind, your human self, you can't bring all those colors with you. You can bring a sense of them, but you can't actually perceive them while you're in human form. So you may imagine something and not quite be able to name it because if we can't see them we certainly have no words to describe them. Another example is that in the spirit world there are more dimensions than there are in this world and I have a um, I'm interested in science and I find that science sometimes mirrors spiritual experience in a way that can help us understand. So if we understand the workings in one field, we can translate that understanding into spirit. We can say, I, I don't see it, but I kind of get it. So the example that I commonly use to explain spiritual dimension is the analogy of flatland. Now on YouTube, there's a, a dozen videos on flatland. The classic video is from 1965. It's 11 minutes long. There's a Russian version. It's in English, but the title is Russian on YouTube. Uh, and flatland is a an, an, uh, metaphor, an analogy, a fable that was invented by a man, uh, William Abbott, in the 1800s. And he wanted to explain the fourth dimension, and he couldn't do that. So he decided to teach a fable that limited us to a two-dimensional world so that we could understand how hard a third dimension might be to understand. And then we could take that understanding of difficulty and begin to understand the complexity of a fourth dimension world. Now, I know how complicated that sounds. So there are videos. And Carl Sagan used this in a portion of his series on Cos uh, called Cosmos. And there's also, in my newsletter, I give the link for that. And in that video, he demonstrates the simplicity of flatland, where you only have two dimensions, like your cards on a table. And then a sphere comes, and a sphere makes no sense. It's insane. It introduces the dimension of up, but you have no word for up. And all the systems that you have figured out don't include a third dimension. And then in that same video, uh, Carl Sagan introduces uh, an object that he calls a tetrahedron. And he tries to explain to us why a tetrahedron can't exist in a three-dimensional world. Now, it's not so important that you understand tetrahedrons, because I don't. What is helpful is that if you understand why it might be difficult to have an experience in spirit where there are a gazillion dimensions and then try to recount your experience in a world that only sustains three dimensions. Another way of imagining this is you build a wonderful ship in spirit 
And when you come back through the portal into the human plane, it's like you have to rip that ship apart and feed it toothpick by toothpick through this little tiny portal to bring it into the earth plane. And then you've got all these pieces, but you can't really assemble it the way it was in spirit because it can't be constructed that way here. And this may be why when we dream, we have all these insane images that don't make any sense because we've got all these pieces and we're trying to make sense of them. So we may be reading the energy of the piece and saying, this feels ferocious, like a tiger. This feels fluid, like water. This feels sharp, like an ax. And so you can probably remember the recitation of crazy dreams. Uh, there was a tiger and he bit me and I ran up on the roof and then I jumped off and then I flew away like an eagle. The guide's explanation of this would be that there's an underlying story that made sense in the spirit world. But in this plane, you only have some fragments. But the guide also says, you don't need to understand everything here. That the work that you did is still valid, even if you can't recount the dream. Now, there are other dreams that are more understandable. And those dreams, may be like having homework from the spirit world. So you went home during the night, you came back with a little homework assignment, and it is clear to you, the dream was given to you in a form that is, has some clarity to it, to help you understand something you need to understand, something you need to work on, uh, you know, whatever it is. So I use these tools of science, of uh, YouTube videos, of um, fiction uh, movies of writings to try to illustrate uh, points uh, points in the lectures that are, are not that easy to understand but again the guide says that we have everything we need and our minds may want to understand what the dream is about and if we relax and accept what we remember and just notice the fragments we remember and accept that they may not make a coherent narrative. It's a little bit like looking at 3D uh, pictures. And what they say is you have to soften your focus and then the picture leaps at you. Dreams can feel like that. Uh, so I was bringing up uh, some examples of spiritual paradoxes that the guide talks about in many, many other lectures, and it gave some examples, colors, dimensions. He says that time is different in the spirit world. So again, scientifically, uh, REM sleep is very important. There's a lot of side effects, health effects that happen if you don't get REM sleep. But people who don't get a significant portion of REM sleep will micro sleep. And people say, well, that can't possibly be enough. But if the, uh, I was going to say nutritive, nourishing benefits of sleep have to do with connection with spirit, another reality is that time in the spirit world is not the same as time on the earth plane. And that may be why a micro sleep can work. Because while it may only be a few seconds of earth time, we don't know what the effect in the spirit world is. We don't know how much restorative time we spent there because they don't count time the same way. Um, so those are some examples of spiritual paradoxes, uh, analogies of flat land, uh, remembering dreams like bringing homework back with you. Um, there are a lot of suggestions in this study guide uh, from Ava and from the guide on what you can do to try to do a better job of remembering your dreams. Once again, the invitation is to be very gentle and soft about it and not demand a full-throated explanation, but to begin the process of remembering more pieces than you have been able to remember in the past. Some people say they don't dream. When they spend some time 
recalling very gently in brief notes as soon as they wake up. Some people find that they do dream, but the dreams don't stick around. They, they're not nightmares that you tell you know, several times during the day or remember to tell your friends. They, they seem very soft, like fog. They just come and go. It may also be possible that you don't remember your dreams. There's not a requirement that you remember your dreams. And what the guide says is that the work that you did is valid whether or not you remember in human consciousness exactly what you did. So those were some of the points that I, I wanted to cover. Uh, so what I'll ask now is the people who are online with me, if you have any questions or if I missed something, you're welcome to speak up. All of you know how to mute and unmute your, um, your audio. So I'll kind of count to three. And if nobody has any questions, we'll be done. Where, where, in the, where did you find the, the material about the spiritual purpose of sleep? I'm not looking at the study guide right now, but I quoted it in the study guide. I thank you. I haven't read the whole study guide. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I don't want to put my head down and start rummaging through papers. Um, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll look for it okay. later. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have a question? I have a question. Sure. Can we use our subjective feelings upon awakening as a way to indicate what kind of messages we might have received? Instead of should, um, I want to say yes to any way that you remember. So subjective feelings are based on something. Um, and that reminds me of something. So I'm going to talk for a bit about this and see if this answers your question. Uh, one of the aspects of the lectures that I, I have a personal, I, I love them. I, I just, I tingle all over when I read these portions. Uh, and it's, it's very prevalent in the lectures on dreams. The guide over and over in lecture after lecture says that every thought and every feeling becomes a form in the spirit world. So we don't see it. We don't experience it. It's not something tangible in our dimension. However, that's what people who study the human energy system, that's part of what they're perceiving. They're perceiving that when you're negative and you put out negative energy, some people are very sensitive to that. They can, they can sense it. The guide is going one step further, and he's saying that if you imagine hope, there is, I have to be silly because I, I don't understand the process, but there's a little ball of hope that has been created because of your conscious intention to create hope. So in answer to your question, when you awake, and you have subjective feelings, the question would be, where might they have come from? And the whole process of working with the Patrick lectures is about self-analysis, about digging deeper than our first conclusion and finding out where our feelings generate from, how they are triggered, what they are triggered by. Some of them are triggered by fear. Some of our feelings are in reaction to events that we experienced as children. And some of them are real and they're based on things that we may not be able to touch or feel, but they're still real. Does, does that respond to your question? Many times, in response to a dream, when upon awakening, there's a subjective feeling that accompanies that dream. So that's why I was asking the question, because it's, sometimes you can feel the dream rather than remembering details about it. Exactly. And that's what this lecture is about. 
it's an invitation to accept your feelings and see if you can come to more awareness about what those feelings may be describing. Um, there's another lecture, uh, lecture 124, uh, which is about learning the language of the unconscious. And it's a, it's a very wonderful lecture, and it talks about learning about yourself, learning about what is in your unconscious, because the unconscious does manifest. But you have to catch it. You have to notice it. It's like it dances around in peripheral vision sometimes, and you have to have a soft focus and just notice and gather evidence of how often something may be happening and see if you can connect it to other feelings. It, it's kind of a very, it's a cosmic or spiritual puzzle that you have to put together and you've got to be careful about jamming pieces together just because you think they ought to fit together and being very sensitive so that you get things that fit together honestly instead of of shoving things together because you're frustrated or too eager. Um, another aspect of these lectures, and I really appreciate your questions. Thank you. Another aspect of this lecture is the guide says that the language of spirit is a picture language. Now, we know archaeologically that when you have a picture language, uh, those pictures mean one thing to us and may have meant something else to the people who created them. Um, I was in a, a different kind of class today and we were talking about um, interpreting ancient texts. And one person was saying, I don't understand why we can't just translate exactly what it said. And several of us were trying to explain why that's difficult. The uh, example that, that I keep as a good example is that in German, if someone cries a lot, uh, what they say is that person must have built their house by the river. Now this stays with me because I had a German teacher who said this in a class to a bunch of Australians and we all just stared at each other. But there was one German in the class and she realized why nobody in the room except her and the teacher understood what he had tried to say. Because to him, it's a normal figure of speech, and it's understood. We didn't get it. So I'll say it again. People who cry a lot, the phrase is, they must have built their house by the river. So he asked the lady who was crying a lot, did you build your house by the river? And she just didn't know how to answer him. This is just a tiny example of how difficult it may be to translate the picture language of spirit. When you've got a picture language of your own in your memories, your emotional memories, your psychic memories, your, your physical memories. And what is especially tricky is our ego demanding that something make sense and superimposing a narrative on a process before all the evidence has been brought forward. So it's like a detective drama where somebody's trying to guess who committed the murder when you don't have enough facts yet. And this is the process of discovering your own psychic nature, your own spiritual nature, the language of your own unconscious. And in translating messages, that may be offered to you uh, from another dimension. So I'm going to check in with you and see if that, if there's anything left in your question. I'm good, thanks. Okay, <laughs> thanks for asking. Does anyone else have a question? Or just let it go. I was thinking that when you said about the millions of colors, Maybe there's also millions of feelings. Could that be possible? Because sometimes when I wake up, I wake up with this feeling that I don't, how, I don't know how to name. It's a feeling that I don't really, and it just flutters by and leaves me very soon. So I can really not pinpoint it, but I cannot 
I can also not name it as one of the regular feelings that I usually have. So maybe that's it. Maybe it could be. Very likely. Mm. In other words, when I give an example of colors and dimensions, I, I, I can't even imagine what other examples there might be. I have those because the guide gave them to me as suggestions. So yes, feelings could be another area where there are more nuances and more flavors and more depth of feeling. And remember that all you need to confuse you is one more dimension than you are used to handling. So a five-dimensional world in spirit can be as incomprehensible to us as a 10,000 dimension world. It's just that far beyond our grasp. Anyone else have a question or comment? You're welcome to do that too. Okay, so thank you for joining me. And what I'm going to do, um, please forgive the awkwardness, I'm, I struggle sometimes with this, is I'm going to put on the screen uh, uh, three um, website addresses. Uh, the first is for the International Pathwork Foundation and all the lectures plus information on Pathwork communities, helpers and programs can be found on this primary website. Uh, the second website is mine. I have uh, self-study guides and an archive of newsletters, plus a number of other um, uh, self-study options. And the last one is uh, the site that I developed to uh, explain what the weekly meetings are like. So uh, thank you very much for watching the video. If you got this far, I really appreciate it and I uh, hope that this mild explanation will inspire you to um, download the study guide or search through the lectures and find something that makes your heart sing. Thank you. So, uh,